All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 22nd day of January in the year of our Lord, 2024. It's a Monday. Wow. What do you it make? <laughs> yes, when you're uh, no longer working for a living, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And I couldn't bring myself to go to church, quote unquote, yesterday. It's like, why? Why do I want to subject myself to that? One of these days I might go back. I don't know. It depends. Let's see. It should take him about six months to get out of Daniel. He does. At least he doesn't go one verse at a time. Okay. So uh, the uh, the other day I did a video on a Lutheran pastor. He apparently had received a question or a comment asking, "What well, was the form of a question? Is Christianity a relationship or a religion?" And he definitely came down, Pastor Wolf, my, uh, Wolf Mueller came down with uh, the response, it's a religion. Relationship's a bad idea. And then he brings up the example of uh, the briefly popular genre in pop Christian books of Jesus is my boyfriend kind of thing. Um, yeah, silly books written by silly women. And that's actually a biblical word. Paul refers to silly women. It's not usually translated quite that way, by, by the, but that's what it means. Um, not that all women are silly, it's just some of them are. But yeah, actually there is a certain legitimacy to that because the scripture refers to Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. So some people can take that and get some romantic ideas. And it's not entirely wrong, but it has to be put in the proper context. <laughs> or it can go in some pretty strange places, like we see going on in Rome today. The, the uh, Pope's new head of the um, department, I got to put it in normal English here, Department for the Sound Doctrine of the Faith. That's not its exact title, but I'm trying to translate it for other people that aren't Roman Catholics. Well, they keep changing the name of that thing, too, so it used to be called the Inquisition. So, anyway, they have uh, they're, they're the new head of that. Recently, I think it was September, Francis appointed him, Bergoglio appointed this guy, the head of that department. And if there's, well, this guy, it, it turns out he's written a several semi-pornographic books. One was for instructing teenagers in how to kiss, and it has a good deal of erotic poetry in it. The other one, I guess, is worse. I don't know. I really don't want to read it. I do have them on my hard drive. But I have them in Spanish because they were written in Spanish. Uh, and my Spanish isn't that great, but... I mean, there, there's words I run into I haven't encountered before. <laughs> Put it that way. All right, so, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so this is... This is um, but there is, in Roman Catholicism, and there's, among the saints, there is a certain tradition of certain female mystics having, uh, and also, by the way, in a semi-Protestant, um, let's see, what, it's sort of the edge between Anabaptists and Protestant groups. Uh, there was uh, some groups that often referred to the relationship with Christ in somewhat romantic language. 
Um, so this is not completely improper. But again, it has to be Christ as my boyfriend. It's a little bit <laughs> like, no. In fact, according to the Apostle Paul, marriage is supposed to be a, shall, shall we use the word analogy? That's probably the best word. Uh, to our relationship, our eternal relationship with God, and Christ uh, and God. Um, so it's a very intimate, very close, very binding relationship. And it was created for that purpose. Marriage was created for that purpose, to be an analogy of that, which is one of the reasons why probably God gets upset when you desecrate that earthly uh, image of our relationship with God, what it's supposed to be. All right, anyway, so this uh, pastor, Wolf Mueller, uh, came down on the religious side of things, as a good Lutheran. Because that's the, what he was expressing was exactly what I grew up with, even though it wasn't LCMS, what I grew up with. But it was the, uh, uh, I didn't I really understand until he said that, what I had experienced. And I mean, I, sometimes I hear these Lutherans talking, pastors, and I'm like, what's he really talking about? Law and gospel. I assume that was the distinction between the Old Testament law and the New Testament gospel. No, that's not what it means, apparently. It's living under both simultaneously. Oh, that explains the expression simultaneously saint and sinner with Luther, too. So you you sin under, so you are still under the Ten Commandments. I, didn't, I never understood why the gospel, after I got saved, why isn't the gospel in Luther's small catechism? We had to memorize that to get confirmed. I know now, <laughs> just found it out the other day. Because Luther never understood the gospel. It was, so he, he was, he never got out from underneath the law. So he has, so every day, and this was my experience growing up, and just what I absorbed from Lutheranism without actually being taught it before, you know, as, as a child and then growing up and what you're taught by your parents and everything else. So you sin daily, and you repent and ask forgiveness daily. So it's, you know, you, you sin all day long, and then you're, told, you're taught to say a little prayer before you go to sleep, asking God to forgive you. Now I lay my, how does it, how did that go? I don't know. I don't need to repeat it. Stupid. Um, so asking God to forgive me and to, to take me to heaven or whatever if I die while I'm asleep. Anyway, that's what you, so you, you, you have this relationship, and it's not just Lutheranism. This is Roman Catholicism. It's just more complicated with Roman Catholicism because Lutherans don't have to go to a pastor or a priest to confess their sins, and they don't have to do penance. So it's, as I determined long ago, it was, Lutheranism is simply Roman Catholicism light, once I became familiar with that, too. Not quite the same way, though. But yeah, it's it's uh, sin, ask God to forgive you. So the gospel is that God forgives your sin for Lutherans, apparently. That's the gospel. God forgives your sins. And the sacraments have to do with that, too. The, the Lord's Supper has to do with God's forgiving your sins. And apparently it doesn't last because you have to do it over and over and over and over again. Um, so Christ's death on the cross just pays for past sins? How does that work? Because he died before any of the sins were past in our lives. It's, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. It's religion. It's a religion. I was thinking about this this morning before I got out of bed. And, um, uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism, all of it is religion. Religion. It is uh, it's just all of the same stuff. It, it goes back really to Constantine, but it was already coming in pretty strong before that. So it's a religious system. It's like the Old Testament under the law. You sinned and you offered sacrifices. You sinned and you offered sacrifices. It's just under the gospel. It's really cheap. You don't have to spend any money to get forgiven. It's just but you're left a slave of sin. You live, especially Lutherans, you live like the world, pretty much. Not quite as bad, but pretty much. 
I mean, it. it's not so much what you do or don't do either. It is your relationship with, with religion, your relationship is tied to the church. The church is, is very central to your relationship, your, to your religion. But that's your relationship with the church, especially Roman Catholicism. You're related only to God through the intermediary of the church. That's how it works. It, it injected itself in there, in the place of Christ, as the one mediator between God and man. So, and religion has, uh, may say, it may claim to be sola scriptura, but as I found out, it's not. It's not really sola scriptura. Okay, so, yeah, it's, it's different. That is not real Christianity. There's two Christianities. Let me say, make this comment. There's two Christianities. There's Christianity as a religion, and there's Christianity that's a relationship with God in Christ. Two different things. Same word, two different things altogether. You can be part of both. Typically, a person that is in Christ usually goes to a church if they can tolerate it. Um, I was saved outside of a church, outside of a organized religious club that calls itself a church, a sect. So even though I'd been raised in it, I mean, I was in the military at the time, so you're, you're separated from family, you're separated from those connections. So it was, and I, it never, I would have really been weird if I had been born again while being a Lutheran attending Lutheran church. It was like, what in the heck is this? What happened? Uh, you better call the shrink. Something's weird's going on here. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and I didn't understand what it was either. I mean, I, God kept sending me these roommates through my room. You know, like, uh, I remember one guy, young, young guy, no young women through my rooms. No, that, they were in the dorm though. I did not like that. I did not like that. I, I guess it was a bit of a prude in a way. When I was walking down the hall with just a towel wrapped around my waist going through the shower, I did not appreciate young women necessarily walking through there, too. <laughs> or occasionally running into them in the, uh, in the bathroom facilities. Guys are bringing them into the dorms. They had their own dorms. We weren't allowed to travel over there. Yeah. Not that I had any problem with young women, personally, <laughs> but uh, it's like, okay, a little bit of privacy here, you know. I guess today it wouldn't make any difference. You'd be worried. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's a little bit of an off-subject thing here. But uh, I ran into, the other day, I also ran into a, a, um, a young former Southern Baptist woman that built a YouTube channel platform thing all about her apostasy from the Southern Baptist and becoming a militant anti-Christian. Her deconstruction, I suspect she went to secular university. Yeah, I've been there. It's for a born again Christian, you can hold your own, but it's not worth the fight. It's not worth the battle. If you're going to be outspoken for Christ, if you're not going to just sit there and and listen, but rather challenge the professors, it's it's a real struggle. It's it's just a lot of work. Not that it's hard to challenge the instructors and the professors. It's pretty easy. However, it's just daily combat. You know, you, you have to have you gotta get combat pay for it or something at least, because it's something else. But this, uh, I don't want to actually show the YouTube channel. Um, I don't think I want to make it too personal. But she has a, a store. And it says here, welcome, black sheep, heathens, Jezebels, and Sunday school dropouts. Our designs are blasphemous and irrever irreverent reflecting the path that many of us have taken away from the traditional Christian mold. 
Our apparel celebrates the individuality and freedom that comes from rejecting the constraints of organized religion. Because, see, we're talking about religion here. So, uh, not, <laughs> not relationship. So, come and check out our selection. Our eShop is a safe place where you can express yourself and find clothing that resonates with your journey away from the Christian faith. And so here we, we have, you can get for 25 bucks, you can get a t-shirt that says evil, a wicked child of the devil, a witch. And uh, this one over here, this is especially good. I sold my soul for Jezebel, Jezebel Bri vibes. Uh, so she even takes the biblical character of Jezebel, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, of course, and the New. Um, so these are 25, here's one that says no gods. Well, nobody has no gods. This this young woman is her own god. Oh, this one too, this is clever. Tell Jesus I'm not interested. And you can even put it one on your baby. Evil, wicked child of the devil, witch. Well, you'll find that that might be true. Uh, generally, by the time they're two, they start to manifest the flesh. They aren't born again when they're born the first time. All right, so I, I, I watched a video from her, and at first I felt sorry for her because I thought, oh, she went to college. Somebody introduced her to Calvinism, and she got poisoned by Calvinism because she mentioned Romans 9, okay, which is a Calvinist proof text. And, but then as I watched more of the video, I realized, no, that's not the problem. She was actually looking for reasons to reject Christianity. She was searching the scriptures for or informed by others of certain scriptures that she could, that she didn't like and use as an excuse to reject God. And she did. However, she never knew God. It's, it's obvious. Southern Baptists are filled with people that it's Southern Baptism, Baptists are religion. It's a religion. It's a cultural denomination, cultural Baptist, more than anything else. The vast majority of them are not born again. Of course, the most famous Southern Baptist was Billy Graham. Um, make a decision for Christ. Yeah. It's, does, but does God make a decision for you? That's... It is, and it's all manipulative. I remember watching some of his um, videos once upon a time, and it struck me just after I was born again. And, and I, it struck me that he's using psychological techniques and uh, crowd dynamic techniques, and that's the flesh. It's all about the flesh. Billy Graham Crusades was all about the flesh. It wasn't about preaching Christ crucified. Very seldom did he actually do that. He did things that appeal to people. He wanted to appeal to, to people. And the vast majority of people that go forward at those things were already Christians, church attenders. Were they saved? <laughs> or did they just want to go forward at a Billy Graham crusade? Yeah, it's like on the air radio prayers. I remember a place I was working in the Department of Communications. Well, it was not working like per pay, but <laughs> it was, uh, I was uh, given the title of the, of the head of the video department. <laughs> All right. So, but anyway, it was, why did I get on that? I don't know. But you get, uh, you get, there's two Christianities. There's the real one, and then there's the religion. And People that are religious, like the, the Lutheran pastor, what I would say in his defense, he doesn't know what the real is, uh, probably. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given that argument. He would have said, yes, it is a relationship. If you don't have that relationship, you're not really a Christian. But it also has religious aspects to it. But really, you're talking about whether it's Roman Catholicism or Protestantism or Orthodoxy. You're talking about religion. Because it doesn't have, you can have, you can be, Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, okay? Supposedly they're good Catholics. Well, see, you can be a good Catholic and go to hell. That's, that's, 
That's the issue. You can be a good Catholic and have no relationship to Jesus Christ at all other than being his enemy. Now, that's religion. That's religion. Uh, in the New Testament, you have Simon the Magician, Simon uh, Magus, he's sometimes called, that believed and was baptized, but his heart wasn't changed. He was never born again. And that's what real religion is, and that's what this uh, this web this person that does this uh, the militant anti Christian, which is also the spirit of Antichrist, and it manifests itself in her too, setting herself over God to judge God without even considering, because she wanted to reject it. She she didn't belong to Christ. The real Christian couldn't do that. Wouldn't you would you would say, well, I don't I have trouble with these scriptures and I don't know what to do with them, but there's something I I know God and He's not that kind you know, there's a reason. If God decided said to wipe out those entire nations, there was a reason. There was a good, just reason for that. And I just don't get it. And if you think hard, you can probably figure it out. But Okay, so we're going to look at real Christianity. It is a relationship, and only a relationship. Just look in Ephesians. Just read the first two chapters of Ephesians and tell me that's a religion and not a relationship. It's absurd. It's absurd. But man loves religion. As I said, Roman Catholicism is the church that man made. It is all religion, and it's all about religion. To be a Roman Catholic, you must be in communion with, not Jesus Christ, but the Pope. So Roman Catholics are in a tough place right now. So if traditional Catholics, whose tradition tells them they have to be in communion with Pope Francis, oh, I feel sorry for them. But there is a solution. You need to be, you need to be in communion with Jesus Christ, which you need, be, you need to be born again to do that. And I was thinking back, at born again, there was a time when evangelicalism, that's what it was about. It was about not only it was not only about the Bible and the cross, but also a real relationship with Jesus Christ that Jesus referred to as being born again or born from above. Same word, by the way. Uh, or born of the Spirit. Not born of the water, that's natural birth. Born of the spirit. So that's, uh, uh, and he said, you can't see or enter the kingdom without that. that. That's your relationship with God. And we're gonna take a look at that. So what what real Christianity is, there's stuff called relational Christianity now. And uh, man, I, I look at that, I've got a book on the shelf that I never read guy, by a guy named Ord. Open and relational. This this is this is not the God of the Bible. Um, you know, certain things I would agree with him on, but in a very biblically defined way. Not this loosey goosey hippie kind of stuff. You know, free love. Uh, I didn't go to Woodstock, but I know some people that wanted to go to Woodstock. They were a little older than me at that time. But the, the Jesus Revolution, too, which I was part of, it wasn't, it wasn't an organization. It was just God moving. And picking up these odd pieces here and there and said, yeah, I'm going to take you. I don't know why, but God picks the losers, not the winners. Uh, look in 1 Corinthians. Re start reading it. What is it, chapter 2? somewhere around there. Anyway, God saved all kinds of, of hippies and drug addicts and all kinds of other things. He just did. And it was all about relationship with Christ. We were in love with him because he saved wretches like us. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's religion, not relationship. Oh, that's so bad. So uh, anyway, back in those days, shortly after that, about the time, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, the peanut farmer. <laughs> uh, Jimmy something or other. 
can't remember his name at the moment. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he talked about being born again. Nobody in the country knew what that was. It was that rare. It was, it was, but not that he was born again. He demonstrated later he wasn't. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Uh, but he was a Southern Baptist, so it was part of their thing. And Southern Baptists were basically unknown other than in the South at that time. Uh, and it was, again, it's a very cultural form of evangelicalism, quote, unquote, very worldly form uh, because it's cultural. They're basically almost as worldly as Catholics and Lutherans. See, religion is of the world. <clears throat> uh, and they use just some strange manifestations of it. Like the ex Southern Baptist, she she didn't know Christ. She she's never been born again, and that's the difference. No relationship there, just religion. She was raised in a religion, and it was like bondage to her. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. The Ten Commandments is like all that kind of stuff. Keep these rules. That's religion. She rebelled against religion. She never knew Christ. Completely obvious. Because otherwise she would have just gone to, to God and said, God, why did you do that? Could you explain it to me? If you do it honestly, I mean, if you're serious, uh, he'll give you ins insight into it. It's not that hard to figure out. If, if you know God, the Holy Spirit's given to us to teach us. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you listen to those college professors. She doesn't say she rejected it at college, but she did say something about calling her pastor to ask him. Yeah, some professors that did a number on her, but she's been wokeified. The word woke has progressed too, I don't know. So let's let's find out what true relational Christianity is. What true Christianity is. That's a relationship with God, what God intends it to be what God promises it to be. So let's first of all go back to that anti-relational chapter in John, chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. And you have John's encounter with, or Jesus' encounter with a, a, a Pharisee, a rabbi, a member of the Sanhedrin. This is an important man uh, that comes to him by night, obviously didn't want to be publicly seen. I don't think he wanted... He comes sort of in the name of the Sanhedrin, too. I don't think he wanted his approach to Jesus to be necessarily public for not necessarily personal reasons, but perhaps uh, he didn't want to be uh, publicly associating the Sanhedrin with Christ because they didn't quite know what to do with him or what to think about him. So he comes uh, and confessing that we know that you are uh, a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs unless uh, that you do unless God is with him. That's verse two. Verse three. Jesus answered, "Doesn't this is he just just Jesus gets right to the point. He doesn't mess around with chit chat like, chat like I do." Uh, Jesus answered and and said to him. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, but born again in this context makes more sense. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Literally, it's from above. But uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? So Jesus said, you must be born again or born uh, from above. Both meanings are true. How can he be born when he's old? You know, how can he be born again? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Obviously, Nicodemus is a, a teacher, a rabbi, a member of the Sanhedrin. He knows Jesus is not meaning literally. He's saying to Jesus, what exactly do you mean by that? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, literally born out of water, and out of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, or out of the spirit. And I bring that in there because it's important. It's not just uh, born of water. It's true, 
and born of the Spirit, but it's literally out of, because it's it helps clarify the next thing he says, verse 6. He's not speaking, it, it clarifies that he's not referring to water baptism, too. For that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Spirit. This is a very common Hebraic construction where you have a, a couplet of two phrases or lines. Like in the Psalms, you see this all the time, where they say the same thing uh, in different ways. Or you sometimes you have one says one thing and one says uh, a, a, an inverse of it. Uh, Hebrew is a fairly simple language, I think. I'm not expert in it, so it's it is it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that Greek has. So by doing this, you can make something more clear. And if you have a limited vocabulary, English is a huge vocabulary. It's one of the problems with using it, too, for translation. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. That's the second cup line in the couplet. That which is, unless you're born out of water and out of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God because uh, that which is born of the flesh, this is natural birth he's referring to, out of water, Husband, fathers, mothers, you know exactly what this means. And then he makes it very clear the second time, out of the flesh, natural birth. But that which is born out of the spirit is spirit. So that which is born out of flesh, your parents, your mother, is flesh. That which is born out of the spirit is spirit. This is a very important thing, too, because Adam, in fact, I just realized this when I was thinking about this, is uh, Adam died spiritually when he sinned. Remember the garden? They ate of the fruit, and he, God said, the day you eat of that tree, you shall die. And he did. He died spiritually. His relationship with God was cut off. Uh, he, he had no connection to God's spirit. He was simply flesh. God wasn't present in him. Uh, so he's, the, he's, his spiritual connection with God's broken. And God is truth, and God is life, and God is light. And without that, he became of the devil, darkness, and dead. And out of Adam can't come life because he has no life in him to give. I mean, spiritual life. Uh, I assume if Adam had not sinned, then when they beget children, begot children, they would have been born with that relationship with God. That connection would be there. But since that connection had been broken, uh, he did not have the Spirit of God in him to pass on, naturally. He was dead. He was nothing but flesh dead flesh, or spiritually dead flesh. All right, so uh, that's why you have to be born again. You have to have that capacity, that connection with God reestablished. You cannot do, as Jesus said, uh, uh, you can do, uh, apart from me, you can do no good thing. You have to have that relationship with God. You can't do good without that. So that's what he says there. Um, where else? That, that's it. That's what I, so let's go to, so when he's talking about you must be born again, he's talking to a teacher, a, a rabbi. And he says a little bit below, he says, uh, uh, Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Well, it's, in other words, Jesus says, you should have known this, Nicodemus. So what was Jesus referring to? He said, born again. What's he referring to? The Old Testament. At the Last Supper, Jesus takes a cup of wine and says, this is the new what in my blood? The new covenant. The new covenant. That has something to do with being a Christian, doesn't it? New covenant. What's it really about? Is it about drinking the wine? Is that what the new covenant is? 
What did Jesus—he died on the cross to establish the new covenant. What was poured out at Pentecost? The fulfillment of the new covenant. They had to wait until the Spirit was given. More than that. So what is the new covenant? Well, if you look in the book of Hebrews, you can find it, or you can go back to the Old Testament where it's being quoted from. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not just with those, because the New Testament makes it very clear, the Gentiles, we are grafted in to the tree of, of Christ, and along with the, the, all believers, the one new man. So he's talking here specifically to, to Israel and Judah, and Christ is, of course, of Judah, of the tribe of Judah, and he brings in this new covenant that replaces the law, the covenant of Moses, which he made obsolete. By fulfilling the law, both by obeying it completely and by paying the penalties of the law, which was death. The wages of sin is death. Not just for Israel, but for the entire world. The, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Said, so I'm going to make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. We're talking about the covenant of Moses. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. Instant, uh, interestingly, uh, in the New Testament, it says uh, uh, something like, and I regarded them not. Why does it say that? Because the New Testament always quotes, apparently, from the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that's what that says. So there's a discrepancy. Is the Hebrew text from 1000 AD the correct rendering? Or the Greek translation from about 200 BC the correct rendering? Yeah. Interestingly, the the, ortho, the Greek Orthodox Church, of course, uses the Greek. You'll find this consistently. If you if you look in the New Testament and there's a quotation from the Old, you look at the Old and says, well, it, sometimes it's a little different. That's because they don't come from the same source. Whether there was, uh, there, was a, there was a destruction of the temple in 70 AD, so a lot of stuff got destroyed. And then there was perhaps some selection by Jewish rabbis of eliminating pro-Christian material from the scriptures. Yeah, and perhaps it's not a serious issue, but I always get on rabbit trails, don't I? So he's going to make a new covenant that's not like a different kind of covenant than the one I made uh and especially when you look at Hebrews, it's very clear. The writer there makes it very clear, which probably Apollos, I think, wrote that. Uh, so, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now, see, the covenant of the law is a covenant of works. Apostle Paul makes it very clear. It's a covenant of works. Do this, and I'll do this. Keep the law, and I'll bless you. Break the law, and I'll curse you. That's the covenant. If you read the curses and look what happened to Israel in places like Germany, he said, yep. In fact, the law says, I'll send another that's like unto Moses, and if you don't hear him, you'll be cut off. Who's that one? Christ. They're cut off because they, they do not believe in Christ. It was in the law. In the law. Jesus said, the law and the prophets speak of me, he said, of Christ. Which is why the, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is the Old Testament prophets speaking of Christ and the promises of Christ. Who he is and what he'll do. This is what he'll do. This is a new covenant that he'll make. That we remember, particularly when we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And again, Gentiles are grafted in. We're one people now. So uh, dispensationalists say this does not apply to the church. 
they are so deceived. Watch out for man's theology. It will just ruin your life. If you don't know what God's promises are, his sure and certain promises, well, you can't trust him to fulfill those promises in your life because you don't know about them. You can't have faith in what you do not know. He says, God says this, I will, under the new covenant, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts instead of on stone. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Peter says these same things too, about that we uh, uh, refer, call, quoting from the law about what the church is. We are the people of God. Again, dispensationalism here is a real issue at this point. Who, what is the church? Are we a parenthesis or are we God's plan? Uh, a lot of people don't know what I'm talking about. That's all right. Some people do. Uh, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. See, this is the young lady that went apostate. Well, yeah, she went over to the other side. That, that's true apostasy. When you go over to the other side. But she never knew Christ. She was an apostate from Christian religion, not from a relationship with Christ, which she never had. She never had it. She was never born again. She just grew up in the, as a Southern Baptist. Probably got baptized because, well, you're supposed to do that. Just the same reason I got confirmed. You know, it's something you just, you're required to do it by your parents. Did I want to go to church? No. And they, in fact, they said, you're going to finish confirmation. We don't care if you go to church afterwards, but you're going to get through this. Yeah, because it's, for Lutherans, they're, they're sacramental. Um, you get God's grace through the sacraments. And that's not really what sacraments are about. But, I mean, for a, for a Bible believer, if you look at the Scripture, it doesn't teach that. But that's religion. That's man's religion. It took a while to get there, too. So you won't, everyone, it says here, you won't learn about God. Somebody's not going to teach you. You will know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. So all, all those that are in the new covenant know God. And the word here, uh, Let me not go there. So we all, all the, one of the promises of the new covenant that Jesus established is a knowledge of God, a personal knowledge. This isn't, so this is something you don't learn from others. This is knowing him. This is a relationship. Somebody you, you know is someone you're in relationship with. It's not someone you know about. It's someone you know. That's, it, that's the whole point here. From the least to the greatest, from the little children who know me to the old men who know me, or the, the not, well, uh, not the greatest. You have to figure out somebody else for the greatest. I'm just old. I'm with the least. I'm just, uh, whatever. Somebody sitting in his garage in front of a camera and a microphone. But I do know God. I do know him. I do know Christ. I do know my Savior. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sins I will remember no more. All right, so there, there's uh, one statement of the new covenant. There's another one. That, th that one, Jeremiah 31, explicitly says, I'll make a new covenant. So in Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 25, about... Uh, you have another promise of what God's going to do. It's not explicitly called the New Covenant, but because it includes a promise of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, we know it is the New Covenant. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. This was part of the cleansing under the law, especially of the priests and stuff. 
See, uh, Peter says we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. The word generation means something that springs forth, that uh, the descendants of. In, in that chosen generation, the generation of Christ. So it's not a particular, you know, we think of like 40 years. That's not, that's not what it really means. It can be used that way sometimes, but. I will sprinkle clean water on you. So now on, on the promises of the new covenant, who's the one doing all the acting? We? Is it all about what we do or about what God does? But God, it's all, it's a unilateral covenant. God does all the work. We're the, re we receive the work, the gift of God. It's all his work though. We know him. They shall all know, I, I will forgive your sins. I will give you a new heart. I will write my laws upon your heart. Who is doing the work? Who is doing the action? It is God. Here, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So it's God cleaning us, God washing us. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Who does that? God. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's God. So uh, a hard, cold heart and replace it with a a, uh, a warm, soft, living heart. That's the difference between a heart of flesh and a heart of stone, isn't it? I will put my spirit within you, the promise of the Holy Spirit. and cause, Now, this is different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, like with David, the spirit was with David, but not in David. The same way in the new, uh, uh, when Jesus was on earth, the, the Holy Spirit was with the apostles, but he says, he's been with you, but shall be in you, in you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So that's, uh, it goes on with other promises, but they're, uh, you know, all, uh, they're more in a physical sense, but they have a spiritual meaning behind them. For example, I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields. Well, think of the parables. Think of the New Testament. Does God literally bless us physically? Yes, he does. My garden is blessed. However, spiritually speaking, what's, what we think of the fruit of the trees in the New Testament, what's that? Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. And the increase of your fields. You're talking about the Jesus parables of the grain, for example, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Again, you're talking really the fruit of, of the Spirit, the fruit of God's uh, working in us, so that you'll never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. And God does bless his people physically, too. I have never, working with the homeless, I've never, ever, ever, uh, it, except in one case, and that was deliberate. Uh, found a true Christian, a born-again Christian, that was homeless. I'm sure it happens temporarily, but, you know, I've never seen it. There was one young man who was a missionary. He would deliberately, he was living a homeless life. He would go from shelter to shelter, preaching the gospel there. He would live among the homeless as homeless, but he wasn't really homeless. And he would go from shelter to shelter and preach the gospel in the shelters. That's how he did it. He took the injunction to, to take no bag uh, or extra garment with you, literally. I, that was for a particular group of people at a particular time. So, Do not put God to the test. But in his case, he's, uh, you know, I don't know what happened to him, but he would have a high workload nowadays. So th those are the promises in two places in the Old Testament. Those are the most extensive uh, list of what God's going to do. That's what it means to be born again. That's what Jesus died for, to bring this in there. And of course it includes the forgiveness of sins, but not just the forgiveness of sins. It includes... Especially knowing God. Jesus said in, in John 17, to know God is to have eternal life. 
And of course, also in John 3, he says, those who believe in me have eternal life. So is that a relationship? Being born again where you know God and God forgives you and God does all these things in you personally? Is that religion or a relationship? I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's a relationship. So, but the, the world is full of Christians who follow Christian religion but don't have that relationship. They simply have religion. Oh, all kinds of denominations are just filled with them. Some denominations almost exclusively. How many Roman Catholics are born again? Very few, I think. How many uh, Church of Christ are born again? Very few. Um, I mean, that's a rationalistic, it's a set of rules. So if you're following rules, you're following religion. If you're following something other than, than Christ, you're following religion. If, you, if your religion is centered around something other than Jesus Christ, it's religion, just religion. I mean, you have to know Christ. It's not just knowledge about him, it's knowing him personally. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, as Paul said. If Christ isn't in you, if you don't have his spirit, you don't belong to him. The world is full of people that call themselves Christians that don't belong to Christ. They have Christian religion, not Christ. Huge difference, absolutely huge difference. Like the young lady that went atheist, militantly atheist. She never knew Christ. She just knew religion. She apostatized from Southern Baptist religion because she never knew Christ. And it's in an evil time like today, living in an anti-Christ culture like people do in the West. This is definitely an anti-Christ culture. Uh, how are you going to stand if you just have religion? If you don't have a relationship with Christ, if your life is not grounded in Christ, if he's not in you, how can you stand? I can remember it was when I went to the public university. It was, it was difficult. It was difficult except for physical sciences. You know, if you were the... the philosophy and the sociology and that kind of stuff. It was just 100% war, war, because the ideas, those ideas all come from the world. They don't come from God, and they're contrary to God. All the ideas and sociology and everything else are at their root contrary to God, and psychology, of course. It was all founded by atheists and occultists. <laughs> like Jung was both. Uh, Freud was a militant atheist, anti-Christian, anti-religion, anti definitely militant. Uh, in fact, he wanted to create a secular alternative to religion. And he, well, it's just a, religion is just a, uh, something that opposes God, too. See, Roman Catholicism, if you put your trust in that religious system, you're trusting in an idol, a man-made idol, a substitute for that relationship that Jesus died on the cross for. He died on the cross to bring us into relationship with God, to restore us, to restore what was lost in the garden, that living relationship between God and man. And Christ himself is the embodiment of that both God and man in one person. And our connection to God can only happen in Christ. So if you don't have that personal relationship with Christ, you do not have the Father. You can believe that Christ existed. You can believe he died for the sins of the world, but that's not the same as belonging to him, as knowing him, as being his. And that's what I remember about the Jesus movement more than anything else. All the people I knew that were sort of in that because it was we were all people that, that Christ had called to himself. We all knew Christ. We all belonged to him. There were some oddballs and you know that's that associated with it, but uh, it was it was a love for Christ himself, a God given love. We knew him. We knew what he did for us. He died, had died for our sins, and he brought us into this new relationship with him. 
That, that's not religion. That's relationship. That's just one example. Now, you can, as I said, you can be a Catholic and be born of God. But it's not, but your, your, your relationship is with Jesus Christ. It's not with the Catholic Church then. It's with Christ himself. Why you're still in that mess, I don't know, but it's there. Uh, it's the same with a, with a Lutheran or a Baptist or whatever. I mean, I've seen some, met some really born-again Lutherans. Not very many. That's not typical. But then like Southern Baptists, I have, if you're a Southern Baptist, I'm not going to say you're born again. You, you're going to have to prove it. Because I don't, I've, I've been around them. I've pastored the church for a while. It's like, hmm. All I can say is uh, their interests tended to be, on the most part, not everybody, but the most part, something other than Jesus Christ, even on Sunday mornings. It was something other than Jesus Christ. It was just something to do. It was just another activity, especially in that case. But uh, there's so much, every denomination, a lot of it is just religion. And so it's just like all the creeds, all the confessions, all the church fathers, all the church history. It's all the, the, the history of religion, man, Christian, Christianity as religion. If you love Jesus Christ, you want to know what Christ and his apostles say and what the prophets said about him. Because it's all about Christ. That's a huge difference. So where is your relationship? Is it with a church? Is it with yourself? Is it with something else? Or are you in a relationship, a permanent relationship with Jesus Christ? His workmanship. Are you his workmanship? Or are you following the religion of man?